Hello, everybody, and welcome to another Newsroom podcast. We recap match day three in the new season. If you missed it, it was another terrific weekend in Winnipeg. The games are coming thick and fast. It started with Cavalry nil, Halifax Wanderers nil, Cavalry stay unbeaten, HFX stay winless. Valor beat Atletico Ottawa by two goals to nil. That is three from three and three two nil wins for Valor and Rob Gale so far. As for Atletico, we'll get into why, what, is, what has gone wrong with them, why they're not scoring goals. Uh, no Viti Martinez, no party. Is it as simple as that? Forge 3, Pacific nil. The champs get off the canvas with three goals in a 10-minute period in the second half. We'll break down that as well. And in the nightcap, to cap things off on Sunday, Edmonton, FC Edmonton 1, York United 1. A really good second half in that one as well. As usual, I'm here with my team. And after Kevin Allerman's terrific job as a false nine on Saturday, boys, what I would like from you is what are you a good false something at fill in the blank i am a good false blank at what could you do well occasionally despite not being very much suited to it marty thompson uh what about you my friend i guess considering last week i'd have to say a goal scorer so apparently whenever <laughs> i score goals they don't count it's true so. i like the theme developing a uh, good good idea uh <laughs> what about you charlie or kind of clark yeah I, I have no idea how to answer this question uh cook Okay. Cook, maybe. Yeah. yeah. There you go. Well, you occasionally, I, I, good dab in the in the kitchen. What's one yeah, of your favorite? Yeah, a little bit. Favorite? Not not at the not at the professional level. Yeah. You know, okay. But maybe maybe that, you know in the in the minor leagues. That's good. Like that's that. what, that's exactly what I want to hear. Ben, what about you, my friend? Benedict Rhodes. Good morning. Good morning. I'm gonna be a bit clever here and go for a false design. Something I tried graphic design a couple of times. Not very good at it. But okay. uh, I reckon I could reckon I could do it once or twice. <laughs> yeah, very good. You're also a false birthday hider because uh, it was your birthday this week and you didn't tell me. Uh, so uh, congratulations on making uh, up to number 21, the baby of the bunch, uh, I'm sure. Uh, Brady, uh, what are you a false something at? Yeah, uh, I'm the most left-footed person on earth, so I'm going to say a false right winger. And okay. uh, I'll whip in a couple of Ricardo Charisma outside of the outside of the boot crosses, maybe. Nice. Good for you. Nice Charisma reference. That's a good one. <laughs> uh, although we shouldn't really talk more about European football, really, considering you had France making the final and mm. literally hours after taping that show, they were, they were knocked out. <laughs> You're welcome, England. You're welcome. <laughs> That's good. It's coming home. Uh, all right, let's get into it. Uh, the rundown. Uh, Cavalry nil. Uh, Halifax Wanderers nil. It was the first game. Although a good game, uh, probably a little bit of a sign of what we're starting to see uh, in the bubble in Winnipeg, where legs are tiring, lots of rotation. Uh, and I think, it, you know, coming into the weekend, the, the standard of games in football was truly remarkable and probably unsustainable to continue at that level. And they all came out the block pretty quick. I do think all the games have been good again. Uh, probably, as we'll get into it today, certain games had good halves rather than full matches, as I know Charlie wrote about that last night as well with the York game. But uh, Benedict, you are our man on the spot for the, car the correspondent for this one. Cavalry nil, Halifax Wanderers nil. What were your overall observations from this? Yeah, Halifax looked better than they did in the previous games, I think. So definitely in the attacking front. Uh, Jeremy Gagnon and Lapare was, was brilliant. Uh, and it, his sort of counterpart, Elliot Simmons, was also brilliant in the other midfield for Cavalry. And I think, as, as we'll get to, I think Halifax is still missing sort of a final touch. But I think they're definitely showing signs of improvement. You talk about Jeremy Gagnon Lapare. He's one of very few players left who started outfield players who started and finished every game. And next to him, by the way, Andre Rampasad has done exactly the same. Uh, they brought Polisi in in this one um, to play a little bit of a different kind of midfield look as well. Ben, what was the, I know Stephen Hart talked about that at the start of the preseason uh, that they could start to do that. Uh, did that free up Gagnon Lapare a little bit more? Yeah, I think with Polisi kind of falling in behind those two, it sort of allowed Gagnon Lapare to move forward a little bit more and. And sort of control dictate the match, I guess, from, from in front of them. Uh, he, he was sort of linking up well with the, with the wing and and uh, and the fullbacks, and I think having him a bit more advanced allowed him to see more of the ball uh, rather than have to focus on defensive as well. And I think that really sort of worked well for Halifax. Very, very interesting. Halifax still without a goal, and they are the only team left as we'll get into with Forge later. But they did get their first point. Um, Marty, let me come to you. Is it time? Is it still pretty much? Preseason mode in terms of not panicking. I know they're bottom of the league. I know they're in the final last year, you know, and they've lost their coach. And hopefully, you know, best wishes to Stephen as he goes back to have some, you know, a little bit of a of a, of a minor um, issue there with he's going through. But we'll keep that private. But my point being is, obviously, it's not ideal three games in, and they've got a week off now. Maybe that'll help him a little bit. But 
not too much to panic on, but as we've seen with other teams stretching away, we haven't really seen Halifax get out of first gear, really. We have to qualify the injuries, I think, in the absences first, right? Like, James Griffar is still with Haiti. Uh, Peter Schall, he was in a boot walk around the hotel, um, and we saw Kareem So step in at center back, and, and he performed pretty well. Mateo Restrepo stepped in at center back. He went down injured. You know what I mean? A lot of these teams are dealing with this stuff right now in the bubble, which again, it was, we expected it. You're bang on. Yeah. I mean, for, for all these teams, it's just, you know, two things. Can you stay fit and can you be, can you be effective in the attacking third, considering you didn't have a lack of preseason? Right. I think Halifax is dealing with both of those pretty, pretty, uh, pretty clearly right now. And, and Charlie, we've seen different looks, haven't we? We've seen them try throw a front two and then, a, you know, a four, three, three, different ways to go about it. But I guess your, your overall thoughts, seeing this team from day one, you feel like they've still got it in them to come back. Yeah, they do. There's, I, I think I've said this about a different team already, but there's a lot of talent there, and it's, it's probably too much talent for them to not turn it around. Just we've seen these attackers combine so well, and I think part of what made Halifax so special at the Island Games was that chemistry and how they were able to be kind of in sync going forward, especially on the counterattack and with these quick breaks and it's not quite there yet. Um, I mean, I know that there's some some different names in this group that, and and we are, haven't necessarily been able to see them get you know, Akeem Garcia and Joao Morelli and Alex Marshall on the pitch together. Um, but I I I think that's something that will come once again they have their their main attackers in the lineup together on a little bit of a more consistent basis. Uh, because again, like really, really where this team thrives is when those specific players are, are clicking mm. in, in the attacking third and they're able to win these balls high up the pitch and they're able to just destroy teams on a counterattack. Interesting. And I guess that will come with more match fitness as well, right? To get to that level mm -hmm. of tempo that they can get to. Ben, let me turn back to you. You watch the games closer than any of us. What about Cavalry? I know it's the first game they didn't win, but what was the overall uh, feeling amongst you know Tommy Wilden and his players after the game in terms of getting another point and and, and, and maintaining their unbeaten status? Yeah, well, all, the, all the coaches, but especially Tommy Wilden Jr. said they just want to get as many points as possible in the bubble, and I think if you're not going to win, obviously it draws the next best result. And uh, defensively, they were pretty solid. I think they they uh, bring it to Creefy Yao and Mason Trafford in a minute. I think and. Yep. They were, they were both really solid at the back, and Elliot Simmons just in front of them. They were, all of them were just a very good trio, so stepping in for Klomp and, and Norman Jr., uh, Trafford and Simmons, that is. Um, I think they were just really solid defensively and, and definitely deserved at least one point in that game. Let's talk about Elliot Simmons a little bit here because you know what I like doing on this show is giving some love to individual players. We did it quite often last week with a couple of Valor players, but um, Elliot Simmons and you know has made our team of the week this week. Ellie and I picked Elliot Platt and I last week at media last night at Media, media Pro when we watched all the games. And um, Simmons has been terrific uh, in this midfield. You know he obviously got the big goal in midweek and then it was terrific again on the weekend. What do you like most, Benedict, about what he brings to this Calvary midfield? Yeah, I just think he does all of it really. Like he he can play offensively. He can he pass the ball with the best of them in this league. He scored a goal the other day. So he, he has that in his locker as well. And defensively, he, he's picking off passes. He's, he's making tackles, and I think he kind of does a little bit of everything. Which when you have a midfield that also includes on on Saturday anyway, Joe Dechara and, and Nick Ledgerwood. That that's a, that's a heck of a trio, and I think he compliments them very well. Yeah, he's been very good, Marty, hasn't he, Simmons? Yeah, he has. And again, it just it speaks to Cavalry's depth, right? And, and the, the number of midfielders. And we're going to talk about the center back depth, but, you know, Elliot Simmons, right? Victor Latore, we talked about him last week. He's just another piece of this machine that just keeps churning out results. I know they didn't score, but at least they didn't concede. You called it a machine. Brady, let me turn to you. This is what we're expecting from Cavalry. I know Charlie's been on this for a while. We talked a little bit before, but there's this... And Charlie makes a great point. We, I think he said it last week. Does this just expectation that anybody who comes in, there's this drive that you reach this level and you play for Cavalry and this is it. And no, and it's almost seamless. I mean, I know we'll get to Pacific in a minute and many people were high on them and we saw a little bit of a drop off yesterday with the, with the depth against Forge. But when you look at Cavalry, there hasn't been any real drop offs. I know they didn't score in this game, but there's the, the high level of quality through three games has been pretty pretty impressive despite four changes. Camargo coming off early and, and there's still the depth being able to be quite strong Brady 
Yeah, and and it's still going to add to this group as well, right? We still haven't seen Joe Mason amongst others. And like you said, I think Tommy perhaps has, has maybe done the best job of rotating, you know, from, from the goalkeeper all the way up to his forwards. He, I mean, he got Tyson Fergo a game. He looked, he looked good in goal as well. And, you know, like most teams have, haven't really, you know, they haven't recycled center backs and they haven't recycled holding midfielders as much. You mentioned Halifax sticking to the same group and, I know Forge, Pissett, a lot of these guys have played the same two, the tandem in center back, but mm-hmm. he's gotten rests for Klomp. He's gotten rests for essentially everybody, right? And like you said, it's not it's not a big dip in, in quality, which I think we've seen a little bit with some teams this past weekend when they really rolled the die. But uh, Wheeland Jr. has not been afraid to give people uh, a couple of minutes off here and there, and they haven't looked worse off as a result. I think that's also just because they're fit, right? A lot of teams are struggling with that. And <clears throat> maybe, uh, knock on wood, that was the issue with the Island Games, right? Cavalry just ran out of bodies. And mm-hmm. so Tommy knows the the opposite of that. So why not take advantage and rotate as much as you can when you're healthy, right? Yeah, really, really good points. What I like about what we've seen so far, and I'm sure some of the players don't like it, but the fact that the games have come thick and fast is that we've had a lot of windows open to different players. We've been, if they were playing once a week, I'm not sure some of these players would have got the minutes that they're getting, but we're really getting an opportunity to see so many of these players right now. And players are getting a chance to start and finish games as well. Um, you know, I think that's terrific for all of us. You know, I'm a little bit skeptical of, of, of obviously putting a badge on them right away and you, you analyzing them too early. We've got to give them opportunities and, and succeed and fail, of course, in this league. That's important. But Karifa Yao played both games this week. And, you know, they've, they've rotated a little bit. You mentioned Klomp and Trafford played one game each as well. After the game, I believe the Tommy Wilden Jr. said, quote, all of our centre-backs can play. We're lucky in that regard. We have a really good centre-back core and he's a huge part of that. I'm really proud of him. Um, center back depth again for cavalry here. Uh, we've seen it in the past. Obviously, they've lost big man, the big man in the, in the in the winter. But Benedict, your overall thoughts on Yao, the, you know, from CF Montreal coming in and performing really well this week. Yeah, I think that quote was from Mason Trafford, uh, who obviously knows him better than any of us. Um, I haven't played against him this weekend, and uh, I thought, thought Yao was brilliant. He's, he's, his passing has been brilliant. He's he's been solid defensively. He's he's good in the air as well. This is just kind of helpful in corners when you have some players on Halifax, for example, who can. Get their head on the ball. Unfortunately, they're missing Peter Chalet. He would have maybe been a bit more of a challenge for Yao, but mm. um, he was good in the air. He was good with his feet, and he definitely looks like a player for the future, um, possibly at the MLS level as well. Yep, Yao also making our team of the week. Your thoughts on him, Charlie? Yeah, he's not maybe the same kind of, of defender as some of the other guys at Cavalry. He's, he's certainly not the same kind of defender as Mason Trafford, mm-hmm. um, but he is, a, I, I think, if you would ask Tommy, he'd probably call him a modern center back, right? Because he is very good with his feet. He has a really good passing range, and he's very comfortable with the ball. And, I mean, he's he's pretty young. What is he? 20. 20, 20 years old? Yeah, and, and just to be that comfortable with the ball, even with a new team uh, already, is is really, really impressive. Just Because, uh, obviously, Cavalry loves to play out of the back, and they, they really like to have that methodical buildup from their center backs. And just to have a guy like him... And obviously, Dan Klomp is, is pretty much the same story to be able to come in and move the ball with that kind of confidence is, is really impressive. And, and what a great player to learn from, uh, you mm-hmm. know, in training as well. If you, you have to look at Klomp, because as you're right, and Klomp would have made the team of the week if he played both games because he was absolutely brilliant in mm-hmm. mid, midweek as get, uh, again. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, a little bit of a schedule change this week. Uh, Ed, FC Edmonton and Halifax Wanderers don't play midweek games, so a little bit of a break for HFX. As for Cavalry, no break. And what a match Thursday against Forge. <laughs> that will be a special one. That is the only match that night. And quite frankly, we don't need another one. That, means, that is its own no. billing right there. Uh, Forge against Calvary on Thursday night. Okay, moving on. Valor 2, Atletico Ottawa 0. Um, anybody last week, by the way, who had Tom Cruise in our Rob Gale bingo would have won. <laughs> if you listen to our show last week, one of our questions was, what, who will be the next celebrity coming out in Rob Gale's press conferences? Uh, he went on to make a horse sound post game. Uh, so as Benedict said in our text message, Secretariat would have won probably. Uh, he didn't. No one picked a horse, and no one picked Tom Cruise. Uh, but the, it, with the reference is after winning two nil, two nil, and two nil, Rob Gale said, "We're not Tom Cruise dancing on a couch right now." Um, but you'd understand that they are happy and things are going well. Charlie, you are our correspondent on this. And again, here we go praising Valor, who have. 
four players. That's right, four players in our team of the week, which I'm going to get to in a minute uh, as well. Uh, we are giving them all the love. They are no longer the underdogs. And quite frankly, this was probably one of the most comprehensive wins we've seen so far in the 2021 season. Yeah, it was. Uh, I just want to say that I'm not sure I understand the Tom Cruise on a couch reference. I don't, it was I don't Oprah. Know. It was on Oprah, Oprah. Okay. so it's a it's a it's a gif. It's a, it's Tom uh, Cruise like going crazy on a couch kind of thing. As yeah. as as but, he is want. Yeah, to I do. mean, I mean, Tom, Tom Cruise was dancing on Oprah's couch the same time that uh, David Brent was popular. Uh, so yeah. anyway, it, little, <laughs> little data in the references. I'm, anyway, I'm, Valor, I'm, Valor all Valor for, I'm all in for David Brent, but hopefully we never talk to Tom Cruise ever again. Carry on, John. That, that's <laughs> fine. Uh, Valor, Valor Football Club. Uh, after that game, Mista. From, from Atletico Ottawa called them the best team in the CPL right now. And I don't think there's any way you can argue with that because no other team has been able to put in these, these 90 minute efforts, right. And in, in considering the conditions, it's, it's so hot. It was, I think it was raining on Saturday when they played Atletico Ottawa uh, and, and it's the third game of the season. And they've just been so, you know, cohesive as, as this unit, they've had a ton of players that I think it's like six or seven of their players have started all three games. You know, the the defensive line has, has pretty much been the same. They've had Raphael Oheen starting every game, Austin Ricci leading the line every game. And for them to still be able to be this just across the board strong is is really impressive. And and they're not wilting as as they go on into games. Like they're they're kind of growing into games. I mean, I think that's two games in a row that they go up a goal in the first half. They play Pretty well in the second. He didn't. Rob Gale didn't really like his second half against Halifax, where they really did soak up a lot of pressure. But this time around against Ottawa, they only allowed four shots. They they had to lead the whole game, and then they add another late goal to to kind of see it off. But it's really impressive just the way that they've been able to put in these ninety minute efforts when a lot of other teams really haven't been able to do that. Yeah, the fitness level seems off the charts as usual. You are right. Seven players: Siwa, Pena, Shabara, John Baptiste. Raph Oheen, Kevin Allerman, and Austin Ricci all started in every game so far. By the way, they've changed systems every mm-hmm. game as well. First game, they played with a flat midfield three. Next game, they played with a two and Rea as a 10. And then on Saturday, which I thought was really, really interesting, and you, you know, I was in the post-game press with you as well, Charlie, and, and I was happy to chat about this, but they basically played with a back three and they played with Allerman as a false nine. I used him as a, as a reference off the top of the show for a reason because I thought – he was terrific in that position. Mm-hmm. And then they had Ricci and Akio just basically using their pace and darting between the channels to push to, to prevent a massive problem with Atletico Ottawa playing out and also in their pressing game as well. That again, Charlie, shows to the speaks to the ability that they can change on the fly and follow the instructions of the team as well. Yeah, it's it's really hard to have or to play with an identity this early in the season. It's a lot harder to be able to play with several. And to be able to show these these kind of different tools in the in the toolbox, yeah. but the way they set up on on Saturday I, against Ottawa might have been, I think, the best they have looked in these three games. Yeah. I mean, Ricci and and Accio's, as you mentioned, just running down center backs, just mm-hmm. putting pressure on. I think, I think Rob Gale explained it. He said we wanted R two to put pressure on their four, so that Alleman is right in that space behind them to to pick up any any mistakes, pick up any loose balls, and it worked out really well. Just I, I don't think there there can be a a more terrifying sight as a center back than to have Austin Ricci and William Accio coming down on you mm-hmm. because they're both they've got so much pace and and athleticism just to just to run you down and, and they will be relentless trying to get the ball. And then the other thing that that they did, which which is part of the shift, was having Raph Oheen next to Daryl Fordyce in that du- double pivot ahead of the back three, which really really works to kind of allow Oheen to maybe venture forward a little bit more in a safer way because he obviously loves to to pick up the ball deep and just drive it forwards, right? But he was able to kind of work off four dice so the, the two could kind of cover for each other. And, and when Oheen did make that run, he wasn't leaving acres of space behind him because four dice would be dropping into that pocket behind him. So I just think that this is a really, a really in sync look for Valor, who everybody kind of knew what their role was and it, it came off pretty much perfectly. Yeah, Fordyce was terrific as well. He's almost the gatekeeper for the Rhino a little bit. <laughs> Just making sure he doesn't go too far away and then come back. Um, shout out, by the way, to Tony McHale in his first professional start. He was absolutely brilliant in the back three as well. Every credit to him. Um, 
Marty, let me turn to you. You're in the bubble. What's the overall thoughts with Valor? There's, you're in the hallways. People are having breakfast together, discussions. What's the talk about Valor right now? Glad you brought this up. The, it, it's a different vibe with this team, and it's a different vibe with, with Rob this season. You know, like, I, I, it was funny. I was talking with, with Ryan Brandt, the one soccer uh, correspondent here in Winnipeg, and we were just talking about why this could be. And, you know, it wasn't England uh, in the semifinals, I think, for Rob. I think it's more about... Um, you know, they're contenders now. And maybe maybe that's just a different mindset to take. And maybe everyone's bound to be just change a little bit after a start like this. I know that I know that it's early in the season and I know some teams are, are weakened because of injuries, but you know, it, how how could you not maybe be changed a little bit? The vibe is the vibe is good. Like the vibe is 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 really good, but it's also like, you know, you can kind of tell from Rob, you know, it's it's almost like less jokes now. It's a little bit more serious, a little bit more buttoned down. Um, which I think is going to be interesting to see how that manifests itself, let's say, four weeks from now into the season, right? Right, yeah. And talk about, you know, they're still getting players back. Gallardo, yes. Gallardo came on and played three minutes at the end, so we'll see how that goes. He looks like a good player as well. Um, talking about getting players back, um, we asked Mista in the post-game press conference about Soto, and he was quite honest. He said it looks like he could be ready for the next game once his ITC comes through. That's the seventh he could play. And quite frankly, after a really good opening game, and I know they've missed VT Martinez as well, but they need Soto, right, Charlie? Yeah, they do. I think the the biggest thing that Otto was missing from that team at the Island Games last year is obviously Francisco Acuna is you know one of one of the best players in the league last year, and he was one of the best players at just creating those those little those through balls, those those just last little pieces of quality that sometimes you need to to score against a team that's strong defensively and they don't have necessarily that kind of creativity in the middle this year uh, or yet uh, but it sounds like Soto is kind of a guy that they've specifically kind of circled as maybe the the option there to the, the replacement for that kind of job I mean they've given auditions to a few different players in that role obviously Chris Manella tried to play a little higher up in his first game, but I don't think that's necessarily his best position. Um, but I think really, really that's, that's going to change a lot for this Ottawa team because they are pretty good out of the back. They're good at kind of building up, but then once they get to the attacking third, it's a little bit of, well, what do we do now? Right. <laughs> right. Right. Uh, la last question for you, Charlie, because I know you watch this really closely um, is Kishon Ferdinand, because he got a goal and he thought he'd scored it and it was his first professional goal and a great moment for the kid. And then it was not given. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. but he did, he, we talked about it after the game uh, with Meester as well. And um, he was really, really good. And this is a theme here. We're going to be talking about, by the way, on young Canadian defenders today. We're going to get into Abzi a little bit later. We've already talked about Yao, uh, but, I thought for 17, he played, for the context, by the way, they played him at right back and they pushed Acosta further forward. And I know he played an hour or so, but what are your overall thoughts with him and, and also on the on the moment with it, which would look like a goal but wasn't? Yeah, well, that was probably the first of, of two baffling decisions this weekend. And then I know we're going to get to the other one later. Yeah. <laughs> by the way, and just for context, that was the loudest IG field has gotten so far. While we've been there. <laughs> Absolute loudest. And it wasn't even a goal. Yeah, well, I, I think we could see just in, in Ottawa when they, they thought that he'd scored, you could see how excited the rest of the players were for him. I mean, yeah, 17, I think Mista said after the game, talent doesn't have an age, mm -hmm. right? And yeah. and he's he's bang on. Like, Ferdinand didn't look like a 17-year-old out there. In a team that's quite well organized, it's sometimes hard to to come in as, as a, an inexperienced player. But he... I don't think anybody could say that he didn't belong in that lineup. He's he's good playing as as the fullback and maybe getting the ball forward a little bit, but he's also done quite well in in some opportunities at center back as well for this team and in these first few games. So I think really it's it's he's not necessarily going to be you know a a first option starter if like going down the road he's not necessarily in in their first eleven yet, but for him to be able to come in and, and play these roles when they're rotating. It's really, really useful to a team that didn't have a lot of depth last year, and now they they really do, especially at the back here. And this is what the Canadian Premier League is all about: giving these players chances to play, and that's what we love to see. Um, 
Brady, I'm going to get to you in a second, so save your voice. A big game to get to you with you. Benedict, like, final thoughts on this game. Your overall thoughts about what Val has brought to the Canadian Premier League through three games. Yeah, they've been they've been really exciting going forward, especially. Um, Richie's been brilliant up top, and they, they just look like they're maybe the most confident team at the moment. They, they just seem to know that they're good. Um, they seem to have a chip on their shoulder. I uh, don't know how much longer they can have that, <laughs> um, as you kind of mentioned a couple of times. But, uh, yeah, they've been really impressive and nearly twice as many points as Toronto FC at the moment. Uh, oh, good <laughs> just reference. For that, just for that little kick. Um, <laughs> yeah, they, they've, they've been really good. And um, you know, Rob Gales, I'm sure, is hoping it continues for a long time. Yeah, maybe that bag of potatoes that they're carrying on their shoulder has got a hole in it right now. And they're just, drop, they're just gradually <laughs> dropping out as they keep winning games. But uh, they have but, so many potatoes, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You're right. You're it's right. a complex metaphor. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> We're all in. We're all in. Uh, but congratulations to Jonathan Siwa, to Andrew John Baptiste again, by the way, to Raf Oheen and Kevin Allman, who all made our Gatorade team of the week. All right, Brady, you're up. Uh, Forge are off the canvas. They are up and standing tall after what was, quite honestly, a actually good second half. And we're going to get to the moments that Pacific could have had as well in this game because we could be talking about a very different Forge right now if Alejandro Diaz had put his foot through it and kept his head down into this, into that into, in the 55th minute in that game. Um, but Brady, you wrote you are our correspondent on this Forge three Pacific Pacific FC nil. The champs are back. Your observations on this one. Yeah, quite honestly, it was a it was a pretty low event first half. I know I, I chatted with Bobby on Friday and we said this could be one for the neutral. And in the end, it was it was pretty cagey to start. I don't think Pacific even attempted a shot in the in the opening 45. But yeah, trust me, I had to find some plays at halftime to talk about on one soccer. It was a challenge. <laughs> yeah, I heard Terry. Terry on the call was uh, sympathizing with you guys. back. It in was. The studio. Yes. Oh, yeah. But no, I mean, obviously, like. This, this game had bigger implications than maybe, you know, like what the, what the table might have suggested. I, obviously, Forge were, were struggling at the gate, but, you know, Palma Duka was expecting the, the repeat champions, not the goalless, goalless Forge. And I think we kind of seen, like, even at halftime, Schoenier said, you know, I think if we get one, it's a matter of time, they'll start flying in and, and three and ten minutes. He wasn't joking. And so I think to be able to, you know, give Borges and uh, and a couple of other guys, Nanko, uh, a rest and, and not have to play the full 90 and still get goals and the meaningful contributions out of them, it just goes to show you what this Forge team can do when they're clicking. And we've seen a small sample size of that, and and, and they scored three goals. So, like I said, they're going to add four and five more attackers to this unit. So it's not a good look for the other teams if they can all, you know, get them in and, and then start to look cohesive. For context, nowhere near the Pacific team that we expect to see. Um, they didn't have Aparicio playing. They didn't have Bassett playing. Um, you know, they don't have Blasco at the moment either. You know, they're still, you know, um, they're still waiting for Valdissimo to play. Yeah. So nowhere near the level that we expect Pacific to be at at the moment. And that's just by design. We've spoke a lot already about the rotation here. I'll get to them in a second, but I do want to bring that to context because it wasn't mm -hmm. like suddenly the pretenders were thrashed by the champs because they weren't really the best version of themselves. And I think Palmer Ducar was openly fine with that. You know, you got to give young players opportunities. And I thought they did okay for a, for a long period of time. And as I said, you know, they could have actually done, they could have been leading in this game, you know, and I thought young played okay, but in the end, he was dispossessed by Kyle Becker in a crucial moment, Brady, in the game that led to the opening goal. And Becker seemed to be the man who said to Forge, I've had enough of this. 20 minutes to go. We still haven't scored. Let's go. And I think we just lost Brady there. But Marty, you know what I mean by that is that Becker was just able to just stand up and take this team on a different level, wasn't he? Yeah, and, and, and this team, I think, played in the second half. It was much different. I think we'll bring Brady back in here. In the second half, it was... It was um, it was much different. And Becker, you're right. He, he's just a leader. And when you have players that, you know, like Tristan Borges has, has had a, has had a difficult season so far. I know he scored for the penalty, but when you have those attacking players that have been stifled and have been sort of waiting to get off the mark. Yeah. Uh, yeah it's great to see a player like Kyle. It looks like Brady, Brady's just in, uh, in, in no man's land here. We'll try to, we'll try to bring him back in here. Maybe while you work on that, I'll get the thoughts of the other boys, but Charlie, this seemed like forge a little bit, had enough. I remember Awua said after the game midweek, 
no more time for excuses, time to start playing like champions. And a goal mm-hmm. does a lot for confidence. And, you know, Babuli's goal at the near post, a little bit fortunate, but the goal certainly gave him a ton of confidence, Charlie. Yeah, it did. And and he's not usually a player that's lacking for confidence, but I, I think it's always, it's always important just to get off the ground. I mean, I think the longer you go without scoring, the more you get in your own head. Right. And, and sometimes it, as a player and as a, as a full team, I mean, no matter how many trophies you've won, if you were to come into this game and, and you struggle again, then you really would maybe start to feeling that doubt creep in a little bit, right. uh, regardless of, of how talented and, and how confident this team is in general. So I think what we really saw was, you know, they, they do score that goal. It's, it's a pretty well-worked goal with, you know, 20 are holding the ball up and, and Babuli coming in to finish it. I think just Forge kind of exhaled when they put the ball on the net there, right? And they were playing a lot a lot looser after that. And, and you know, two more goals sail into the net, one almost immediately after. And it, it they, just, they just seemed a lot more like themselves just once they sort of remembered what it's like to, to be just playing a little bit more free. Brady, what was the overall thoughts post game in when you spoke to the players and the, and the, and the coach, was it just a, a bit more of assurance and, co- and confidence after getting the three points? Yeah, honestly, they didn't, they didn't look a surprised group. They looked like they, they kind of stuck to what they've been saying this whole time. You know, they were, they were showing a little bit of patience through, through the first two games and, and they, they honestly felt like, you know, it was inevitable that it would turn around. And I don't think, that mindset changed afterwards. You know, Moba Bully was a pretty cool character for a guy who, who you know, he's been pretty heavily criticized. And, and Marty did back him to score the first goal of the year. So <laughs> shout out to shout out to Marty for ding, that. Ding. But one point. But yeah, I mean, they did like, you know, it's hard. It's hard to sometimes gauge, especially through these Zoom calls, what people are really feeling. And you know, if they if they're you know if they're genuinely feeling a little bit of pressure. But like I said, the the answers were were consistent across the board, be it Bobby or. Any of these other players, they, they've been there, done that. It was a matter of time, and I think they, they showed that yesterday. I understand it's game three of 28. I understand there's a ton of games to play. But bear with me one second. If things hadn't gone their way yesterday, if Diaz had scored, if they didn't win, with Cavalry coming this week, already pressure on them after two games, that storyline would have been a ton very, very different. It took, you know, that, that would have been a lot different, but here we are now, and this could be one of the moments when we look back and talk about Forge making the playoffs, that this could have really helped them turn around their season, Benedict. Yeah, definitely. I think um, starting at 0-3, obviously, is not ideal, um, but I think as Charlie said last week, that, like, if any team's going to turn it around, it's, it's going to be Forge. Like, Forge can be the team that's that's always going to be a powerhouse in this league um, with, with the players that they have at the moment, and uh, that's obviously a, a good start to sort of get things rolling at the moment. Not without cost. We'll keep an eye on what the, the, the news are, is with Tristan Borges, but, you know, great to see Borges back. Great to see him get his goal and obviously go to the top of the, the, leader, the leader's chart in terms of all-time goal scorer in this league. Um, really cool, calm penalty, by the way. Just looked at the, the goalkeeper and was like, oh, no, I'm just going to dink it into the corner. Um, but Brady did go off late in the game and looked like he had a bit of a, quite a large ice pack on his knee as well. A little bit of concern for, for Forge and we'll keep an eye on the news with this. Yeah, it was it was quite a heavy tackle from Caden Chong, a clean challenge, but his his knee seemed to buckle in the turf, and these sort of things happen pretty easily on the artificial surfaces, right? But you know what's encouraging is that Tristan looked like he wanted to come back on the field, and Bobby kind of put him in a bear hug and said, "Sit down, mate. We're up three goals with five minutes to go. You've got your goal. Like, there's yeah. there's nothing out there for you, right?" So we didn't we didn't get too much clarity on that. Obviously, that's a that's a big storyline ahead of this Cavalry match. We'll keep an eye on that, but. Uh, at, at at this time, it's it's uncertain, but uh, like I said, encouraging that he at least wanted to finish the game on his own terms. And Brady, back to you again, a final question on this. What about Pacific? As I said earlier, we clarified, they weren't the version of themselves that we expected. They did sit Bassett. They didn't really show, maybe they didn't show Forge by design that they're the, their best 11 yet, um, and they're far from that anyway with Blasco not there. But what were your overall take from their performance? Yeah, I think, you know, sometimes it can be hard to, you know, evaluate and, and assess how important, you know, deeper lying midfielders are. But when, when Bassett wasn't in the lineup, I think we really seen how much they missed him in, in transition. They defended pretty well in the opening 45 and it'd be easy to criticize Bustos and some of these attackers, but they just didn't get the ball really. And I think Bassett being out was a big part of that. You mentioned some of the other injuries and, and situations they're dealing with. So it's hard to be too critical of Pacific. I think Pabadou Ka was 
was confident that this was kind of a kind of a one off in that way. And so definitely far too early to write them off. I think, you know, some people on Twitter thought I was uh, a little bit harsh in the match analysis, but I, it was more about, you know, who they were missing and, and what their actual potential is than than writing them off three games in here. Don't read the replies, mate. <laughs> Never read the replies. Uh, all right. FC Edmonton won. York United won. Uh, Charlie, Marty, you watched this really closely as well. This was the final game of the weekend. Um, I know, Charlie, Alan Koch said after the game he was far from happy in terms of their mm-hmm. performance. So I guess this, to start with them, is a little bit more of the evolution of FC Edmonton. Is it not? Is it, again, fair to say that this was a game last year? And I know they missed the penalty, but based on the performance, this was a game last year they would have lost. Yeah, maybe. I, that's that's an interesting way to think about it because I I was a little surprised to be honest with just how disappointed Ellen Koch was with that game, um, and it probably shows just how ambitious they are as a club at the moment with with how much better they want to play. Mm-hmm. If if that's you know if that's the worst of the three games in in their opinion, good point. Uh, then then you know it it, it speaks to me that that they want to play some pretty impressive football. Uh, but this this game really was, I mean, it was a bit of a chess match the whole way through. And, you know, maybe fittingly it ends as a complete stalemate. You know, it's, it's 50-50 in possession. Each side had 13 shots, I think. It, I, I, the draw is probably the fair, the fair result. I mean, ni- neither was really, you know, taking control of the game for much of it. There was no, I mean, really the, the only goals were just little bursts of individual quality that, were able to break down, you know, two teams that were playing a little bit, maybe a little bit conservatively at times, just playing in, in these kind of low blocks, these sort of counteracting four two two or four four twos uh, that just kind of ran into each other and couldn't quite solve one another, except for these little moments of quality where you just run through things and, or you know kick the ball through everybody, <laughs> and and you just break these these structures because otherwise there wasn't really. A lot of a lot of threatening attacking play in this one. Let's get into the individual quality, Petrasso, in a minute. But Ed first, and we're not <laughs> burying the lead here. Uh, Marty Thompson, uh, you're our experts on when a goal is really a goal. This was really a goal. <laughs> <clears throat> the the stadium did get loud for this one as well. Uh, yeah, what a hit this was. Um, I know Charlie, you asked in, in the post game. Uh, was this the greatest goal he, goal he's ever scored uh, in a game? And I think he said yes. I mean, he said he scored better. He scored better goals in FIFA. I think yeah. it's how he qualified it. But he said this one was pretty close. This is just such a hit, right? And like, you know, he obviously he's playing right back, and we like him in this role. I think uh, for, for the most part, I do, anyways, for Edmonton. But you know, he can play up. He, he's a talented attacking player. But I mean. This is just something special. Edmonton only scores worldies. Is Absolutely. I was checking the replies. I was checking the replies last night. Sorry, yeah, Christian, and that's it's one of those. Saying. It's one of those moments where even looking from the the wide broadcast angle, you can see a player's eyes light up because mm. <laughs> Fraser Air just sprints through this pass to cut it off. He you know takes a touch forward and then he just looks up at the net and kind of shrugs and fires it. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's what he said. That's what he said too. He's like, it just kept opening up. Yeah, it's opening like, up, opening up. Okay, I'll take it. that every time. <laughs> and it, it, it was beautiful. It's amazing that FC Edmondson, I don't think anybody would have picked them, no disrespect to the team, that would have been the one to entertain us the most with these absolute rockets at the same net, by the way, the same end yeah. in the same week. Obviously, Asua getting the brilliant goal early in the midweek as well that we, that we recapped on Friday. Go back and listen to the last episode to talk all about that. And boy, well, boy, do we have some good storylines in that as well. Uh, at the other end, Michael Petrasso comes on, and I think he was needed. I think him and Noah Verhoeven came on and made a big difference with some real moves movement and attacking flow in this one charlie petrasso nice goal and then a, a strange celebration as well with his uh little fingertips to, to, telling someone to be quiet i'm not sure who it was yeah opening his yeah. mouth a little bit i i don't know what that was i don't know who has been has been talking that he wants to silence but you know important we know goal who michael, for him though right? it was an important goal for him and then we know who michael petrasso is and he ne- hasn't necessarily been able to, to, you know, in in two years at, at York, he hasn't really been able to be himself for, for extended periods of time yet. I was obviously injured a lot last year, and, and this season is obviously quite young. But he's an incredibly talented player, and he has been in Canadian soccer for some time now. And he's he's a very important part of this York side. I mean, he's one of 
one of maybe not very many players on his team that has a lot of experience in the game, especially at the professional level. And for him to be able to come into this game late, you know, for a player of his caliber to be fine with playing that role in this game, to come into this game and immediately change it is, is really something that York didn't necessarily always have in the past. Right. There's these guys mm-hmm. that can come into a game and do that. And Petrasso will usually start for this team, but for him to be able to do that, I mean, kind of get acclimatized to the game almost instantly is really a an important trait in a player. Here's, for con- here's some stats for context about how important Petrasso is to this team. It is an extremely young team. Petrasso can re- really be the leader, both on and off the field, the tactical leader, the game changer for me going forward. Already this season, York United 1,051 minutes for their under 21s this season. Already over 1,000. That's with Felix Ensar, Ryan Lindsay, Jordan Freer to come. Nicholas Hamilton, by the way, heard rolled his ankle in training, so we'll keep an eye on that. That's why he's not been involved. Uh, Julian Ulbrecht did an ankle ligament strain before he left Toronto, so he's progressing well. And a shout out for Lowell Wright, who now has made more, played more minutes in this tournament than any other striker in this tournament. And he's 17. And I think he got a little bit tied in this game as well. But um, Brady, that's a pretty impressive run that for a young man to play more for, more minutes than any other forward already through three games. And you could see Jimmy Brennan just giving him the hug as he came off the field. He was full of admiration for the young man. Yeah, 100%. I think, you know, this has been a bit of a theme of this this show for us. We're talking about these teenagers, these 20-year-old Canadian players who are, are playing across the league. And not just playing to, to meet the quota, but excelling and, and really, you know, playing a reliable role on their team, be it as a striker, or a goalkeeper, it's raw. Like, this is just the standard now, which is, you know, it's exciting. This is year three, and we had a pretty pretty reduced year two, so it's tough to develop too much in, in a tournament style. You really lean on your, your veteran players, right? But I think it really shows you the strides we're making and, and you know, like York, like you said, to be, to be at that thousand minute threshold through three matches and, and be competitive in all three is just, you know, is super exciting. I will get to the penalty decision in a second. Before we do that, while we're on York, one thing I want to do a little bit more of is go around a bit, bit more of a round table going forward and highlighting certain players each week that I want all of your takes on. So I think this week we need to talk about Yudin Abzi, who's been probably, if not what the best, arguably one of the best players so far in this season of the 2021 Canadian Premier League. A player still really young, 22, and a player that I'm sure has big admiration of playing in Major League Soccer. Um, by the way, there's some teams in this country who need might kind of might, might need a left-sided player, I'm just saying. Um, <laughs> but the way that he's playing right now has been very impressive. I tweeted last night, for me, it was a, a, above everything else. But I want to hear what you have to say, Benedict. Let's start with you. When you watch Abzi on a pitch in the Canadian Premier League this season, what impresses you the most? Yeah, it's just technical skill. He's, he's sprinting up and down that left-hand side, and he's, he's, he's finding passes. He's, he's beating players on the run. Um, he's getting into good areas, as we saw with his, with his header in the second game. And uh, yeah, he's just he's just been overall really impressive going forward. And I don't think we ever really anticipated him as a, as a left winger, but he's done a tremendous job there. And I think now we're talking about him as one of the best left wingers in the league, maybe even. Marty, what about you? I think it's the it's the composure just to sort of piggyback up Benedict. It, it's the it's the composure and the confidence, right? First year, you know, he was a, he was a first year pro. He was impressive for sure. Second year, you know, it was it was a bit of failure to launch for York, and then this year, he's one of few players on this team that's been with York for three seasons, and now he's obviously given this this expanded role. And I think it's just the confidence that he brings, right, Charlie. Yeah, for me, I think it's the way that he's expanded and evolved his game from that first CPL season, yeah. where he can't he comes in, he was immediately one of the better left fullbacks in the league. But now he's in, now that he's in this more attacking role, you know, Tariq Muhammad is a huge addition for York because it allows Abzi to get forward, mm-hmm. and just him being able to cut in a little bit more than he ever has and and take players on with more confidence. It, it's really amazing to just see him develop into this more attacking force. Brady, what about you on Abzi? Yeah, I think like you said, he, he's you know he comes into this professional environment, starts out as a left back, does a really good job, but you know now he gets the opportunity to get pushed up the pitch, and he just looks like he's having fun out there. Like he's eager to take guys on. He's like you said, he's mostly played from the left, but when they made some changes last night, he got a look on the right, and I thought, mm-hmm. you know, for him to be able to cut in and use that wand of a left foot, you know, Di Maria Real Madrid style, I think that would be that'd be a ton of fun for York supporters. That's a good comparison. I like that, particularly on the right-hand side. Here's another thought for me, is that this is, again, what the Canadian Premier League is about. This kid, 
you know, starts the Canadian Premier League, 20. He's one of the young players. He's obviously got he's a confident swagger off the pitch, but he, he, he's biding his time, as you said. He doesn't. There's no straight line right between that and success, and he's obviously had a little bit of this difficult time. Then York get younger, and he gets bigger in terms of mm-hmm. the presence on the pitch. And suddenly the continuity is there for him and not for everybody else. And he's looking around going, these younger players need me to show personality on the pitch here. Yeah. And I think that's that's probably another reason why they can't really bury him at left back. Uh, we have buried him at left back on the play, on the team of the week. <laughs> Sorry about that, but we just, for context, but we're having him move forward. Uh, so he has made our team of the week, but he's playing left back. But you know what I'm saying, guys, in terms of like allowing him to flourish going forward and really becoming that technical personality where he can make a difference going forward has been really impressive. Absey certainly didn't deserve to lose the game last night. Neither did York. Charlie, they almost did um, yeah. on a very bizarre decision in the 90th minute. Um, but oh no, Ongaro hit the post. <laughs> yeah, he did. And it, it, it wasn't a very confident penalty. I don't know if we've seen... I can't remember seeing Easton take a penalty. I don't think I don't think that's happened before. Yeah, I and... Remember. And when when we asked Alan Koch about it after the game, uh, I think he he said that whoever their their typical penalty taker was off the pitch at that point. So I'm I'm not necessarily sure who Alan Zeebe maybe, but uh, yeah, I, I suppose he he didn't play in this game. But yeah, it, the ball doesn't lie because that's never a penalty. It was just it just it was bizarre in that it just like came out of nowhere. Like yeah. that happens, and there were, I think there were a couple other penalty shouts in that game, if I'm not mistaken, that would have been a lot more valid than that. Yeah, yeah, like Fraser Fraser Air, you know, t- kind of has the ball at the corner, and I think Ija Halley was up behind him, but I don't think they ever made contact. I'm not sure if if Air trips over his own feet or the the ball or what happened, but. Yeah, I, I Jimmy Brennan said after the game that, that everybody in the stadium could see that wasn't the penalty and you know justice was served. So final final thought on Ongaro he has been the cornerstone of this team. Um but Alan Koch himself said at the preseason that he needs to be better, he hasn't proven himself anything, kind of just lowering expectations a bit, but hiring internally. Uh and then Borchewski played, I thought, brilliant again last night. What a handful this boy is. And it's going to be tough for Angaro to get in the team if they're, if they're not going to play two together, Marty. And the way Warcheski's playing, if your opponent scouting FC Edmonton and your centre-backs, you know you're in for a game with this boy. Ironically, he's, he's, he's well, maybe not ironically, he's a better hold-up player than Angaro is. And like you saw when Ankaro came on, he's just like sprinting around like crazy. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm interested to see how that does turn out. I... I Something makes me think that they'll continue to just be rotated quite heavily. But mm. yeah, I mean, it's also just rare not to have on Garo score goals. Like, and, and you thought the penalty, like you said, it wasn't confidently taken. Like that used to be, you know, on used to lose confidence in this league, right? I do apologize for my awful oh no on Garo joke, but hopefully that's <laughs> yeah, that was too bad. No, but oh, uh, for context, I wanted people to understand why I said it. Uh, it is it is just a tribute to one of my former colleagues at TSN who's currently calling TFT games, uh, the legend himself, Mr. Vic Rauder, because uh, that's exactly yeah. what he would come up with. Uh, at the end of match day three, the week standings are the, the, the standings in the CPL are Valor nine points, Cavalry on seven, FC Edmonton on four, along with Pacific Forge on three, Ottawa on three, and the two teams yet to win, York with two draws on two, and Halifax Wanderers just on one point to come this week in the Canadian Premier League, that's right. Games come thick and fast again. Match day four starts on Wednesday. Atletico Ottawa take on Pacific FC. York United take on Valor on Thursday. Wow, a big one. Cavalry against Forge. And a reminder, Edmonton and HFX have no game this week and will carry on playing next weekend. we got about three minutes left. We do want to wish best wishes again to Stephen Hart. Uh, get better, my friend. And hopefully you are back soon doing what you love and what you are brilliant at. Quick to rapid fire here, boys. Uh, one player whose stock has risen the most since the start of the season. Take it wherever you want. Can be a good player who you already knew and has got better. Or a player maybe you didn't even see before the start of the, of the year. Uh, let's start with you, Benedict. Uh, I'm going to go for the player you guys just mentioned, uh, Warshevsky. I think he's been really good. Um, as you mentioned, taking the job from Easton and Garo is no easy task. And and uh, he's, he's been doing a pretty good job top for FC Edmonton. Great shout. Brady? Yeah, it's got to be Absey for me. Okay. Marty? Yeah, it might be Absey as well, considering how you know 2020 was maybe a bit of a dip, and now he's he's coming right back up. What about you, Charlie? I think it's Raph Oheen, to be honest. 
yeah, with, with sure. him taking on this this bigger yeah. role with with Valor and kind of coming into his own as as this driving force of that team. Really good points. On the other end of the scale, one player you want to see more of needs to be better that you'd expected may have been playing a little bit better despite obviously only three games in uh, Marty. I'm going to say Moba Bully because he's better. He's he's better for the league when he's when he's when he's on fire. Uh, he's also a great interview in the press conference last night. Someone asked him how the locker room was, and he said, "We haven't been in the locker room yet." <laughs> <laughs> Brady, I'm going to go with Akeem Garcia. I think he needs to find the net for Halifax if uh, if they're going to turn it around. It's a good shout, Charlie. You're yeah. not in your head. Are you with that, the vote for Akeem? What have you got? Yeah, I, th- I think Akeem is is the most obvious one. You know, his goal will come. I'm going to go for one of his teammates. I know for John Morelli, he missed another goal the weekend, and you can tell he's getting a little bit frustrated and kind of needs to get one. And then that's to sort of boost his confidence a bit. Good shout. Okay, two screamers for Edmonton. Which one was better? Or maybe in the spirit of Marty Thompson, which one would you prefer to score? Fraser Ed or Asua? <laughs> Marty. Aired. Ed. One vote, Ed. Brady? I'm going to sue. Uh, Arab said he had no choice but to shoot it. Osua had the audacity, so I'm going to go with Osua. <laughs> audacity. <laughs> Great word. Benedict, who are you picking? I'm going for Fraser Arab, I think. Charlie? I'll even it up. I'll say Osua because I just love that little touch with his chest to, to put it in the past. In the that past. means I have to give a vote. Yeah, okay. you have to break the tie. Asua wins by three to two just oh. because just the audacity. I love it. Audacity. Bang. Yeah. All right. Game you're looking forward to the most this week before we wrap up. Boys, uh, Charlie? This might be unanimous. It's Cavalry Forge. I wanted it to be unanimous. I get why we're going there. Let's just say what we're looking forward to the most about this game. Benedict, what are you thinking about Cavalry Forge? It's Cavalry and Forge, isn't it? Like it's 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 the big one. It's the they've had some, some feisty games in the past. They've had and also now adding Joe Duchara into that mix, of course, as well. Yeah. Um the return of Anthony Novak is also an interesting one to watch. And um I'll save some storylines for the rest of you guys, but uh It'll be a good game. <laughs> what, about you, what about you, Marty? No, yeah, it's it's got to be Jody Anthony Novak. That that that's the big one for me. Just the personnel. It's gonna it's gonna be rough and tumble. This is I'm gonna excited. be fun, right, Brady? Oh, 100 percent. I'm just I'm curious if Forge can carry that that second half firepower over to this one. It's gonna be interesting. We're gonna have our editorial meeting next, but a little bit of an editorial meeting on the air. We might, and I don't know if these boys have it up for it yet. We might do a podcast post match Thursday night to get it up early <laughs> after this game. Uh, but we'll talk about that. All right, we will have a podcast for you, whether it's up Thursday night or Friday, recapping all games this week. Uh, congratulations to Vala and Rob Gale, top of the table, three, 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 three match days. Uh, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening and we'll speak to you soon.